switch with Dr. Lita or Dr. Lita, I guess, just to make sure my connection is stable enough in the airport. Is that possible? Um, we can hear you now. Your connection at the moment is fine. Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to Scott webinar series. We are with you today with a volume 16, Smart Community Tourism Development uh, in Indonesia. Uh, our main moderator today is Professor Noel Scott, uh, who has architected this uh, webinar and his team are going to uh, present case studies about community tourism development in Indonesia. Uh, we have uh, presentations first, and it will be uh, followed by a cultural break. We're showing a video um, and that you can move a little bit and get fresh, ready back for uh, the conclusion and discussion session after uh, the presentations. Uh, Please make sure your microphones are muted during the webinar. And if you have any question, uh, please don't hesitate to write it in our chat box. Um, our admin people will collect all your questions and uh, we will answer it um, within our time for the ability uh, or we email you later uh, with the answers. Um, I would like to uh, ask Professor Noel Scott uh, to start the panel, uh, please. Noel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Kazim. And uh, it, it's wonderful to be here uh, again. Um, I, I feel so um, proud. Uh, I feel so proud and so uh, happy that uh, we can have our speakers from uh, Indonesia here today. Um, we met, uh, the speakers and I met uh, during some Australia Awards training courses over the past few years. And in fact, uh, two of the speakers are undertaking those courses um, uh, this year. Um, each, each one of the people uh, who will be talking today are um, actively involved in tourism and uh, uh, research, uh, community development, government uh, in um, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, Lita, I missed out you. So the NGOs, Lita's uh, very active in, in helping to uh, develop tourism and protect the environment as well. So look, uh, so it's, it's great today. Um, each of the speakers will talk for about uh, 10 minutes about their particular part of Indonesia and their project. And I would encourage you to type in um, questions into the chat if you can, because there will be a, a session afterwards uh, where the speakers will be able to uh, answer questions. Um, I think that's really all I wanted to begin by. Or oh, just briefly, I suppose, you know, um, community... So, Tourism in, in communities, small communities, um, is something that's happening around the world. Um, I was involved in another presentation about uh, similar topics in Sri Lanka. And I'm aware that, you know, there, there are people in Cambodia and uh, all the way through uh, Asia, Africa, um, who are getting involved. I think the big issue with 
a community, often a small community, developing tourism is for the people there to know how tourism works and and to have some of the um, skills and knowledge that mean that tourists can be both attracted to their village, but also um, that they can be well um, provided with hosp hospitality, but also that the community can protect uh, its cultures and traditions um, that they want to preserve. So if, if we went back 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, the idea of communities in small villages was pretty unusual. But over that period of time, there's now quite a lot of information and practical experience about how tourism in small communities works. So that means that if you are thinking about developing such an initiative, don't try and do it just on your own. Try and talk to some of the people who are here um, to learn from them. Um, there's books you can read. The, the, the big mistake that I think people can make, the first big mistake you can make when you're trying to get into tourism in a community is to think you don't, you can do it yourself. And you, you can, but if you, you need to learn, you need to make connections to the industry, you have to understand your customers, you have to learn to protect what needs to be protecting. And there's a lot of information around about that. So um, talk to some of the people here today. All right, so, um, and that's why I think it's so good that we've got our first speaker. So um, I met Siska last year, she works in developing community-based tourism in Bali. And she works for a company and that's their job. Uh, well, it's a, it's an, let's say call it an association um, and that's their job. And so she works in four community-based tourism villages in Bali and is actively developing those. So Siska, um, uh, may I ask you to talk first for about uh, 10 minutes and then uh, it'd be wonderful, thank you. Yeah, uh, sure, uh, Professor Noel. Um, I would like to share screen first, my presentation. Okay. I hope everyone can see my presentation now. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, warm greetings from Bali. And I hope all of you are doing fine during this unique crisis. I know this is very, very hard for a lot of people, uh, especially those who work mainly in tourism sector. And I do hope that this situation will be back to normal as soon as possible. Um, thank you again, Professor Noel, for introducing me. And today I'm going to share a little bit about um, development of uh, community-based tourism in Bali from my experience. So um, I work as the program coordinator now at JED. Uh, JED stands for Jaringan Ekowisata Desa, that's in Bahasa Indonesia. But um, in English, people usually call it Village Ecotourism Network. And this is a network of community base in Bali. So we are based in Bali and it was initiated by four uh, village communities and also one non-government organization in 2002. So um, as Professor Noel mentioned, I think the terminology or concept of ecotourism maybe like um, 20 years ago was um, quite um, unusual and not common and still uh, very new. So um, I think that's uh, made this concept was very interesting for Mr. Um, Ardika. So um, he's the former minister of um, tourism and culture on, in Indonesia at that time. And um, he was so keen to support and also get involved in this uh, small initiative that coming from small islands. And the ecotourism model that developed by JET at the time um, was also become a model in the national level. So um, we got um, some publication at the time um, from several medias. Um, currently, uh, JED programs divided into three parts. So first, um, we are um, actively developing community-based tourism in some villages, um, some in Bali and um, some outside of Bali in the eastern part, but um, we are still working on it at the moment. Um, 
And the second one, um, we are also promoting existing um, ecotourism activities that are provided by our members in our network. And also we are providing capacity buildings for our members. So we understand that the, uh, the world changed so fast and um, usually our members also require uh, further um, knowledge or skills and we could also provide in that kind of term. So maybe just um, share a little bit about the history of why uh, these um, four communities actually, and um, they initiated this network. It, for me, it, it was very interesting because it's all, it all began in 1998 when Wisnu Foundation, uh, the NGO, uh, collaborated with five villages to conduct a participatory mapping program. So the program actually aimed to collect all the information about the village. It's uh, about all natural resources, residential, sociocultural, traditional values, um, temple and historical relics, uh, folklore problems. Uh, they also map all of those things. And then um, community villagers created some maps from those information. So usually one community, like one village community, they will produce about four or uh, five different uh, kind of maps contain different of information because they will use all those information to create management plans for the village development. So some of the village, they use those information to create a different kind of um, local regulation. So as you can see from this presentation, this is um, um, some images. It was pretty old uh, um, pictures, actually. Uh, the villagers conducted the mapping activity using, using some um, co conventional tools. Um, at that time, it took like maybe to one or two years to to get the maps, uh, but nowadays it, it's it's uh, pretty short because uh, they already have the GPS tracker and also um, we have now GIS um, system, geographical information system, and they usually use that. And this is the the example of the map as you can see from the um, screen that um, created by the village community. And after they um, got all the maps and they created the regulation, uh, then they um, start to think what they can do with all this information. So in 2002, uh, in 2000, until 2002, these uh, four communities decided to plan and initiate alternative tourism in Bali. Um, it was actually initiated at the beginning initiated by an old man living far away in the north of Bali and he is a farmer, still farmers until now, coffee farmers. And he saw all the problems that at a time in what um, Bali uh, was facing at the time. So this is some articles that you can see. Um, this is the current article, I think, um, that I collect from the internet. Um, if you search all information about Bali and mass tourism, then you all like a bunch of information about what was uh, what what is going on, like uh, Bali running out of water and um, competition, uh, mass tourism destroying Bali and its culture. So at the time, um, the village communities they divided that oh there are three impacts actually. So from the socio cultural um, aspect, Balinese culture often loses its meaning. So the sacredness of many rituals and dances are abused for the consumption of tourists. That's what they thought. And um, because one of the example religious festival, um, for example, Ngaben, maybe some of you have heard, is a funeral ceremony, um, are made more fancy in some areas, in some touristic areas, actually, to impress the outsiders. So um, they also experience life changing and also um, increase of consumerism among the young generation. And the environment, it's um, running out of the water and then um, a waste problem and also um, land conversion. On the economic, um, we are facing the competition, like not, not healthy competition between um, among the businesses and also uh, between Balinese and non-Balinese. And in 2002, until now, in 2002, they um, finally initiated the um, network uh, called uh, Jaringan Ekosota Desa. It's a hub for the villages to promote their potential and also to strengthen the network as a new family because they are coming from different kind of villages and they have different kind of values. So um, this is like a, like a big family for them where they can connect it to each other. 
and this is the uh, the principles of the uh, network uh, to strengthen the community of uh, indigenous people through Bali Due concept. So Due is the Sawisata Ecologis, that's in Bahasa, or if we translate translated, it will be um, ecological tourism village. And it consists of three principles. Uh, first, community knows their potential resources and problems. Community is willing to manage uh, their own resources. That's very important. And community um, is responsible to keep all resources uh, sustainable. I think um, from uh, my experience, actually, from uh, these uh, three principles, they are hoping that ecotourism uh, could strengthen transparency and democratic decision making and cooperation in and between the villages. Uh, they are also hoping that the ecotourism will have minimal impact on the local environment and also could uh, foster cultural understanding through uh, facilitating discussions uh, between Balinese locals and the outsiders, and also could support community development and environmental conservation activities from the fund generated uh, from this activity. So um, in general, I think based on my observation, um, ecotourism is um, for, for all these communities, they, they treat it as a side job, as a bonus, because they they realize that the uh, tourism is very fragile sectors, like it's not only affected, um, I mean, if, if as we can see now with the pandemic, um, we this the impact is very huge and if maybe it's not only a pandemic if we talk about terrorism maybe in bali that's also affecting the the tourism sector um they also use this uh, the ecotourism as a tool so i i could see that the, the community use it as a tool for the outsiders and also for the insiders i mean for inside of the community and also outside of the community for the outside they would like to use this tool to actually introduce that they have different uh, they have a unique value so maybe if you go to bali and then you see all the brochure in the airport then you will see that oh uh, bali from one village to another place they are similar and we've been um, facing like a lot of um, effort, I mean, from um, maybe the government to, to make all the fillets look similar, but actually we are not. And as the Balinese, um, I also work here, I found out that they are so different. So they, will, they wanted to introduce that value to, uh, to people. And from, uh, for the inside the community, they use the ecotourism as the tool to protect uh, their natural resources. So from, the, from these ecotourism activities, uh, from my experience, like one of the fillets, they, they create um, local regulation. They could like introduce to the, the, co the community members that look, uh, we have these natural resources, like people are willing to see it and enjoy it then let's protect this and then they create the local regulation and also they prevent uh, the land conservation because from the mapping activity they could actually see um, how many buildings that they have and then um, how many buildings actually stand in the in the very um, productive land and then they could prevent the land conservation in the future in the future sorry um, so this is the map of bali um, we have um, Kiadan Plaga, this is the village in the, in the northern part. Um, it's focused on the coffee plantation. They have also the forest garden, the agriculture, that's their main sectors. And we have also in the eastern part of Bali, Duku Sibetan, uh, they have uh, salak fruits. I know maybe for some people salak, I mean for, for um, Westerner, maybe it's a bit weird. But um, in Indonesia, maybe we only like uh, we know only like two or three different uh, kind of uh, varieties of salak, but in this village they have about 16, 16 different varieties of salak fruits and they also have hills and garden forests. And we also have Tenganan Pegringsingan. Um, it's a um, village located in the eastern part of Bali. They are well known for their um, ancient Balinese, Baliaga. Uh, they also have wild honey producer and gringsing weaving fabrics. And this gringsing is uh, using double ikat system and it's only three in the world. So I think in Japan, in India, and also Indonesia, it's in only in Tenganan Pegringsingan. And we have also in Chenangan, uh, Cheningan um, Islands in the southern part of Bali. And in the western part of Bali, we have Perancak Village. Um, it's um, focused on coastal culture and turtle conservation. And we also have uh, Nyambu Village in the um, southern part of Bali for its rice field and Balinese culture. And currently, we are collaborating with um, about um, 
uh, about 10 villages in Nusa Penida. We have five villages in Nusa Penida and also another four villages in the north part of Bali. We are um, still now developing in, uh, ecotourism with them. While the others five villages, they, they are already part of our members. So maybe just a little bit um, um, sharing about the challenges in developing community-based tourism in Bali. I think if I could divide the into maybe three main parts. First is mindset on, on what tourism is and how it should look like. Um, so when we when we get invitation from the village and then they say that, oh, we would like to develop community-based tourism, they often say that, oh, um, Oh, it means that we need to have more hotels, we need to have um, restaurants, and then we need to build um, international uh, toilets and things like that. And we said that, no, that's not our uh, principles, actually. Like, the first thing that you need to be uh, prepared is yourself. You have to be ready. And then are you sure that you want you want to have these ecotourism activities or not? So that's the main thing that we need to make sure first. And then later on, um, when you when you are ready, then we talk about the facilities. Maybe you have um, empty rooms in your uh, house where you can actually um, use that as the homestay, and then you can learn how to clean that. So um, often they think about okay, we need to get the money, a lot of money, and then we need to build all the facilities. So I, I think maybe because they they use um, Kuta is one of the touristic place in Bali as the role model, so um, we don't. That's 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 the challenge. That's uh, to tell them that okay, we are actually um, providing different kind of activities. So what we are having in the village it will be different with uh, those people who are um, having activities. I mean tourism activities in Kuta. And the second uh, part is different ecotourism concept between JED and the government and also private sectors. Um, usually, um, we also, in the past, we also get like a one invitation from the government, um, uh, regional government from the north part of Bali. And then um, they ask um, our support to introduce community-based tourism. And then every time we went to the village and then they will always follow us. And then they always ask, okay, what kind of facilities that you need to build? Um, maybe um, restaurant or things like that. So we can create the budget and we can apply, we can propose the budget to the provincial level. So uh, no, that's, we, we are talking about different concept again. So the, the, the concept is not really, um, how to say, we, we don't really have a, the same concept actually. So, and then the last one is lack of human and financial resources in the village communities. Um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the existing members. Um, sometimes when they want to create like a new product, then um, usually they have a lack of financial resources on how to, and also knowledge on how to uh, develop the product because the, the world is changing and then the customers, uh, the trend of the tourism is changing. So um, sometimes we have difficulties in, in catch up with all the trend. Um, so yes, I think that's all my presentation today. And um, I'm so excited because uh, we will also have a different, a uh, lot of guest speakers that are expert in this uh, kind of subject and looking forward to hear uh, their presentation. And also uh, maybe at the end of this, uh, this webinar session, we'll also have a discussion. Thank you. Wonderful, Siska. Thank you very much for that. That's that's wonderful. Um, you spoke very well. Uh, you, um, just a question. So, uh, how, how do you, if someone wanted to contact you and talk to you about um, community-based tourism, would that be mm. okay with you? Uh, yeah, sure. That will be nice because um, I mean, in this in this uncertainty situation, like having more conversation, discussion, will be so good. So we kind of like uh, you know have a plan what what we're gonna do in the future, like facing this post COVID nineteen. Thanks, Siska. And so maybe you could share in the messages your email address or contact or something if you wish, and other yeah. our other speakers might as well. So sure. thank you, Siska. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just moving on, uh, our next speaker, Iqbal, is uh, from Komodo National Park. 
Wonderful. Isn't that exciting? So I don't know if anyone has, uh, if many of the people here have been to Komodo, seen the dragons, but it's, it's a wonderful place. And he is um, responsible for, uh, he's the forest ecosystems manager, but he's dealing with local communities. So we're going to he hear a little bit about how he works with the communities to see how they can develop. So over to you, Iqbal. Okay, thank you, Noel. Thank you, Noel, and thank you, Siska, for the first presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, salve, om swastiastu, dabo budaya, salam kebajikan. Hello, everyone. My name Hello. is Iqbal. Hello. Hello. Do you hear my voice? Hello. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, it's yeah, very clear. Sorry. Speak a little bit louder if you can, Iqbal. <laughs> I'm currently in the airport, so I'm a little bit shy to speak louder <laughs> because everyone <laughs> around, around me is looking at me right now, staring at me. But anyway, I have worked in the Komodo Nature of Park in 2016 as the Forest Ecosystem Manager. I graduated from the University of Florida, USA, and I'm in Siska, uh, same badge in the Australia Award for Course Program, Sustainable Tourism with Professor Noah as well. Uh, in this time, uh, I really want to talk many things about Komodo Nature Park, but Noel <laughs> has limited me to speak only about the community interactions. So I'm going to bring the park ranger perspective in support of improving local community interactions with, uh, with the park. Uh, every time I start my presentation, I always kick things off by showing the map of Indonesia to, to you folks. Many of my former students in the University of Florida and my friends in Jakarta, they were not able to pinpoint the location uh, of the Komodo National Park. So in Indonesia, if you look the red circle that I put on a map, we have two provinces that have a similar name. One is West Nusa Tenggara and the other is East Nusa Tenggara. And then they are very much similar. And then some people, most people, or many people, they cannot differentiate between the West and the East part of Nusa Tenggara. So Komodo National Park is located on the East part so the province called East Nusa Tenggara, uh, specifically located on Forest Island, uh, the municipality of West Manggarai. And uh, if you cannot hear my voice really clear, just let me know. So I'll, I'll repeat my uh, presentation one more time. And then if I speak too fast, because I only have five minutes to, to, to deliver my uh, message, just let me know. And then. You already see the map of Indonesia, and then I'm, if we look closer to Flores Island, here what you are going to see. To get to the Komodo National Park, you have to fly to Komodo National, Park, Komodo National Airport at Labuan Bajo. So Labuan Bajo is the town. Labuan Bajo, if you Google Labuan Bajo, like so many information about that, so many pictures of the park and the people and the creatures, of course, that live within. Labuan Bajo is located on the western part of Flores Island and it is considered as the paradise of Indonesia. And then, oops. okay, so we have look Indonesia, we have look Flores, and then we have to look the Komodo National Park. So this is the map of the park. Uh, so many colors, we, in the, in the park, we implement a zoning system. Currently, there are seven different colors of zone. Uh, every zone system has different functions. And then within the park, within the Komodo National Park, I have put uh, four black circles. That is where the villages located within the park. So currently we have three villages located within the park. If you see, let me use this. If you see this, this, and this, that village, that village is located within the park. So we have, as the park ranger of the Komodo National Park, we have to work with them, collaborate with them, and then create a program that they, that they, that they can uh, uh, multiply and then execute themselves so they can be independent. Uh, we also have village just located around the park or surrounding the park, but I will pinpoint to one a particular village called Bolomori. Uh, drawing. Well, so before we talk about the community and the interactions between the people and the Komodo National Park, I want to 
speed a little bit about the history of the Komodo National Park. This park is one of the oldest national parks in Indonesia. Uh, the management has started since 1911 when the GKH Fun firstly introduced Komodo, National, Komodo Dragon to the world. And then since then, so many people, so many stakeholders put efforts to protect the Komodo Dragon. Up until 1980, the Indonesian government established the first five national parks of Indonesia, one of which is Komodo National Park. We also have uh, three uh, titles, prestigious titles, like World Heritage Site, uh, Komodo Bikes Reserve, and the New Second Wonder of uh, Nature. So we are very, <laughs> quite famous. <laughs> Uh, I really hope that you already visited the park, and you, if you haven't visited the park, then I wish that you someday you can go there and probably find me there. <laughs> so as I mentioned uh, earlier, we have some villages located within and outside or surrounding, um, and this is the pictures of the local people that live inside Komodo National Park. Most of the people are uh, fishermen, fisherwomen, uh, but many of them are also shifted to uh, tourism players. Many of them are working as the tour operators, tour guides, interpreters, dive, uh, dive operators, even dive instructors. So uh, from fishermen and fisherwomen, and then in the tourism comes, influence appears, and then they shifted their uh, jobs into tourism players. And then speaking about Australia Awards in this uh, Badge, I have to work two projects, individual projects and group projects. And then that project really aligned with my daily job as the park manager of the World National Park. So every uh, Saturday and Sunday on my weekend, uh, I always travel to one particular village called Molomori. If you see the, if you remember the dot, the uh, black circle, and it's located on forest. That village is very, very beautiful, but uh, it has not received attention as much as villages on the on its surroundings. So uh, when I visit the village on, on the first place, I see so many uh, potentials on tourism, community-based tourism, adventure tourism, wildlife tourism, because on that village, uh, they also have Komodo dragon, they also have a strong cultures, they also have a crazy, beautiful ecosystem. Uh, where can you find a village that has uh, a savanna ecosystem, a rainforest ecosystem, a beach ecosystem, a mangrove ecosystem in one place? So they have plenty of things, plenty of things, but uh, they haven't reached that point and then they need, be, need to be uh, supported. And then that's why I came to that village every week and, and then talk to the elders, talk to the to the chief, talk to the community, what would they want in the future? What would their village want to do in the future? This is a glimpse of the uh, local community in Golomori village on the weekend. So most of them are fisherwomen. The, the fishermen caught the fish and then the fisherwoman drive the fish so they can be sold or they can be used for longer term. They also, if you see the picture here, uh, there, there's a lady with the bucket on, on her head. It's, it's also a specific uh, culture that they have. So they, they don't usually carry things on their hands. They carry stuff on their head. So it's very uh, common in Indonesia, but in many big towns, that culture already disappeared. And then I still found this on the village. And then on specific days, Specifically Saturday, they also have a shop market. <laughs> Only three hours in in, 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 in in duration. So they they many people go there selling stuff, fishes, uh, vegetables, many things there. And then they are selling those stuff close to the shores. So uh, up until the shores getting into their feet, they will stop the market. In that market, they also have barter. So uh, the local community that live on the mountains, they have or they produce vegetables and the local community in the shoreline, they produce fishes. So on that market, on every Saturday, they have chances to barter their stuff. So uh, from vegetables to, fi to fishes, to fishes to vegetables. And I still found it there. And I see that as a uniqueness because I, ha I, I, I have 
I have intentions when I speak with the village chief how to preserve that barter because the 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 modern transactions is already appearing there transactions with money. But I I, I told uh, the chief that that thing should be uh, conserved, and then we have to figure out strategy how to uh, make the barter effective, and then the people are willing to you to use the barter on the Saturday market. And then there's a picture also of a tree and so many uh, fabrics, white fabrics there. This is also a thing that is very uh, noticeable in the park. If you are a tourist and then you are going to promote National Park, you might not be able to find this in the uh, touristic area because this, uh, this uh, spot is actually a place for the local community in Komodo Island to pray. So long time ago, the, the, the ancestors of the people in Komodo Island believed that, uh, so when the, when the mother, the expectant mother deliver a baby, the, the expectant mother would be killed. So the, the shaman will, would cut the, the, the belly and then uh, he or she saves the baby and then the mother would, would die. And then on that point, uh, on some point, the village chief wife got pregnant and then she will be delivered a baby and then the, the chief doesn't want the wife to be killed. So he summoned a shaman from the nearby island, super powerful shaman from the nearby island. And then the shaman came to the island and then the first place where the shaman landed the island becomes his place. So the ancestors uh, mark the landing place and then flip that and, and transform that landing place into a specific spot to pray, specifically to pray for uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, and then also uh, praying for healthy after delivering a uh, baby. And then I always help the tour guides and then my interpreters uh, group, not only explaining about the common fragrance, because people, when they are coming to Komodo Nation Park, they will be filled out with so many information about the dragon, the other creatures, the wildlife, but they are never uh, or rarely told about the social influence or social or any kind of history about the local community in the park. So I always pinpoint this specific place called Prato to those folks to be delivered or spoken to the tourists. Uh, other than that, I also work with a group of women in that village. Uh, that women is very, very isolated. They live on the foot of a mountain. They they don't have water source, they don't have electricity, they don't have enough education, but they're very good at making carpet from pandan leaves. So when I see that, I go to that, uh, uh, to that temple, and then I learn how to make the carpet using that leaves, and then it's really, really difficult. So I try to help them, try to increase their capacity by inviting uh, experts in handicrafts uh, handicraft and then uh, teach them how to make the carpet powerful, stronger, and more uh, qualified to be sold to the uh, outer people. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh, I know that this presentation is very short and then probably you have so many questions about the Komodo National Park, about the local community, about the small community tourism, and then I'm very eager to hear the questions at the end of the call. I think, thank you, Noel, and I'm giving back the floor to you. Great, Iqbal, thank you. Um, so uh, some lessons that I got out of that were, uh, you know, the, here's the national park, but working with the local people to try and help them, which I think is a wonderful thing. And you've identifying resources, some tangible, but often they are the culture and the traditions and the stories even of the local community which people are interested in. So well done. Okay, so thank you for that. Uh, we better go on straight away. We've got a uh, we've got three more speakers, so we have to rush through. I'm sorry, but our next speaker is Lita. Lita is uh, uh, works with Conservation International Indonesia. And she does amazing things in a number of different places. I have been with her to see whale sharks. And uh, it was the, the most amazing thing. So she works with uh, uh, sea 
um, sea animals uh, to, to both protect those things and perhaps allow local people to protect them as well through tourism a bit. So Lita, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. It was a very inspiring stories from the previous speaker. And then I hope I'll bring something different today on the presentation on the webinar. And I'll try to, um, wait, I'll try to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Oh, here we are. But now? Starting now. Starting now. Okay. Thanks, Noel, for the introductions. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm Lita. I work for Conservation International Indonesia. And today, I would like to share about one of our projects located in Raja Ampat, West Papua. Um, talking about uh, Monterey, community-based conservation and also tourism, uh, Noel only gave me 10 minutes, so <laughs> I hope that it's going to be enough <laughs> to share and present about Monterey conservation, tourism, and key successful towards it. So when we talk about Monterey, um, this is one of my favorite wildlife in the ocean. Uh, Monterey is a, a part of the Mobula group, and it's one of the a part of the Elasmo branch as well. And then if you see the characteristic of Monterey is very different compared with the other fish. So why? Because as we can see, if you have your hands like this, do you want to try? It's a, like a shape of a manta ray, yeah. So manta ray have a very specific uh, uh, morphology, like flat body, and then it has triangular pectoral fins like this, uh, the one that I moved. And then also with the shape of diamond has pectoral, uh, sorry, uh, pelvic fins at the front here. When you see there, as if it's like a mouth, but actually it's not, it's a fin. And, uh, very special because it's, it can reach up to nine, nine meters a wingspan. So we can say that this is one of the gentle giant besides the uh, whale shark that you saw last time, Noel. So this is a very beautiful animal, um, sea animal, but unfortunately there are lots of threats to this species. So according to IUCN, CIDES and CMS, these species are threatened by a number of anthropogenic uh, anthropogenic cause, which is uh, it caused by human activities, including fisheries, whether it's bycatch or uh, targeted catch, also plastic. Uh, to be noted is the microplastic, uh, the gill trade, which is we know in general that people, the Chinese people still believe consuming gills can make them healthy and then, you know, can, can get rid of all the diseases and stuff. And uh, coastal developments, a massive coastal development that also impact the ecosystem, especially coral reefs and tourism. So uncontrolled tourism also threats to Manta Ray, for example, if there is no uh, boundaries, no, uh, not well managed with the numbers of boats, number of tourists, irresponsible behavior, it's also threatened the species. But in Indonesia, fortunately, since 2014, it is fully protected by the Ministry of uh, Marine Affairs and Fisheries. So besides its uh, flagship species for conservation, the last decade, actually, Mantara is one of the main tourism attractions. And why is that? My previous study since 2018 to 2020, two years ago, in Komodo, uh, Bali, and also Raja Ampat, identified that people would like to join Mantare watching tourism to experience, to see them in the wild and then to experience the, um, the encounter with this gentle giant, whether to see the species feeding, mating or cleaning, uh, because the way they attract 
uh, people or tourists is by, you know, very graceful with their dancing, as if they're dancing. And then it's a one of a kind of wow experience that we can get when we are in the water. And uh, so because of that reason, a number of studies also conducted uh, through various uh, countries. And one of them in 2013 by Omei Lee, which estimated that Monterey tourism in global, or particularly in 25 countries, including Indonesia, contribute to a revenue of 73 million US dollar. And then in Mozambique, it contributes 10 million US dollar per year. And in Indonesia, contribute to 15.15 million US dollar just for Mantare diving. So we also uh, tried to conduct studies in 2014 to estimate the value of a single Mantare when it's dead. The value is only 500 US dollar, but when we utilize it uh, as tourism attraction, the whole life of Mantaray will value about 1 million US dollar. So we see as an organization that there is a potential, well, we say alternative potential economic income for long-term conservation and also for the local community. And for that reason, we a number of studies and baseline studies we uh, conducted with other stakeholders as well. And then we come up with a number of key successful factors. Uh, the first one is how we can build a connection with the community. So uh, having a commitment is very important in whatever it is. And in our case, having a commitment of conserving and protecting Mantare is the priority, which is in 2012, the government designated the area of Raja Ampat as the first Indonesia's shark and Mantare sanctuary. It's very clear that they would like to protect the Mantares as well as the ecosystem and the whole important habitat of the Mantares, also sharks. So that's the first thing. And the second one, by developing community outreach through a number of educational activities, also participatory research. We conduct many research, including ecology, um, biology, social economy, in order to have a baseline, in order to have a foundation for what is the next step that we can do based on this study. And of course, working with the local community, with the um, education institution and us as an NGO, it's a very powerful sources. Like we, we deployed satellite tagging to track the movement of the manta rays. So we know which areas are the hotspot uh, for Mantare sightings, which can be utilized for tourism. But also at the same time, we have to ensure the conservation of the area by building networking or MPAs, local MPAs networking. Also community mapping, we, also, we need to identify and gather the community perspective about conservation, about the potential issues about the potential assets that they have and then potential stakeholders so we can get together and work together and build core management effectively and the last one community is the center of the engagement so community have to say about a decision making that they would like to contribute both in tourism and also conservation like for example uh, the community has agreed that Tourists who came who come to Raja Ampat needs to pay seventy dollars per person, and then one of the allocation is for conservation, including Mantare, and have to have a local community works in monitoring and patrol. Also, we develop together with community procedures, protocol, code of conduct of how to uh, encounter with this specific um, fish like 
if you would like to go in Simon Ray, you have to make a reservation one day before. Only 20 people per hour based on our study of carrying capacity. And also uh, you have to follow the guidelines and all the tourists have to contribute to photo ID and et cetera. So everything has been um, discussed, has, has been um, shared with the local community. The next step, of course, is the community capacity building. Besides hospitality and tourism trainings, there is a need of an additional specific uh, capacity building in natural resource management and monitoring. Why? Because this is the main attractions of the area that we need to ensure that when tourists come there and then they can see the mantares, even though that we know that we cannot call them and then say, hey, there is a some tourists coming in this part, are you gonna be there? Of course, there's no guarantee 100% that you can see this animal, but still to ensure the healthy environment, we need to teach the local community, train them to be a part of the monitoring program. So that's why courses like in diving, free diving, uh, naturalist guide, even marine ecology license, uh, we support them in order to enhance their understanding about uh, conservation. The next step is uh, community ownership. So as we know that most of in the places ownership of business uh, mainly dominated by um, people from outside the area, but uh, based on the community policy and planning, the community also would like to engage and then we give the opportunity to the local community to have their part in the small medium enterprises and then so they can have the ownership to in the business in the tourism business like for example dive shops uh, accommodations uh, including homestays bed and breakfast uh, tour operators and also become rangers like Pa Iqbal does in um, Komodo, the local community in Raja Ampat also actively involved, especially women, because not so many women in other places that I see uh, be a part of the monitoring or patrol uh, group. And then in here, we're not only engaging the man who is normally doing the hard work in the sea, women can also do it. And then so we empower them to engage and to have the ownership of the natural resources, especially Manta Ray. So they patrol the fisheries and also the tourist activities. The next step is community product. So uh, product development and innovation is very important uh, by adding value to the products that they already have. So by reflecting the cultural value, the cultural wisdom, and also uh, the icon of the areas, which is Raja Ampat, we integrate the design into batik painting, jewelries, and also craft. Of course, there are many more, many more samples. I just uh, share with you a number of this. Besides uh, community services that provided by the local community, of course, like interpreter, uh, dive guide, snorkeling guide, um, food, uh, almost everything that is uh, being needed in tourism services. The next one is community partnership. This is that I can say we have a very strong foundation in Raja Ampat about how we work together within the area. As we know that, Noel mentioned before, working together, working with other people, working with everyone, not only from your area, but also outside your area, which is true. And it gives you values of knowledge, information. And that's what is important. And that's what makes uh, us can be successful, successful together, I mean, like creating working groups, for example, for monitoring the natural resources, including Mantaray, because we have to ensure that the tourism doesn't affect the sightings of the Mantarays. So we have to do a regular monitoring, uh, replacing 
placing a camera trap to see uh, or to record um, the, the sightings of the manta rays and then we have to identify photo IDs and etc. We cannot do it alone. We have uh, limited resources, we have limited uh, budget and then so with the business owners, they all help and every time they bring tourists and then the tourists also uh, engage by becoming a citizen scientist. Uh, also business units from one village to the other village. Developing in the village on enterprises, it is very essential because you're not working together to promote your product. You're working together to not only to adding the value, but also to promote what we have in the area and public private partnership, which is in Raja Ampat, all the businesses, all the investor has to share the the capital with the local community. So it's not 100% belongs to the investor first. And the second one, all the buildings has to be ecological, uh, ecological friendly. And then so they get the materials from the local community. And the third one, they have to hire the local community to work by giving them training and then be a part of, uh, a part of the team to service the, the tourists. So, Lita, um, uh, we'll have to finish soon. Um, yes, this is my last my last uh, slide, actually. Thank you, Noel. Marketing and promotion. So, integrated marketing and promotion by utilizing all communication tools and sending the common uh, linking to Gale Park, Marine Protected Area, and also um, wonderful Indonesia from Regency, provincial, and national level. So, I think my time is up. <laughs> Uh, the most important thing is, yeah, hopefully this is, can be adapted to other places around the world. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer and please send an email. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lita. And I do apologize for that. Um, you know, um, I know that each of our speakers has got so much knowledge and, and uh, practical information that they could share. It's uh, just got to try and keep people going but it's wonderful thank you okay um our next speaker teddy uh is from monado and uh, he works in a, a university there and he's yes. going to talk about a uh an event i think right okay should i start now Milia? yes please okay everyone dear ladies and gentlemen uh, greetings from the land of North Sulawesi. I would like to talk about um, Visit Minahasa, a special event, basically religious tourism. And I'm, I'm going to focus on um, a special religious time when I call it the land and Easter time. So basically, I will start with my presentation. I just do it into a big screen. I hope I it works. So, Basically, this is the map of Indonesia, and the red arrow, this is the area where I'm going to talk about. So basically, this is what I call it North Sulawesi. And the North Sulawesi, basically, it's on the border between Indonesia and the Philippines, and also on the border with the other province, Gorontalo. Now, the fact of North Sulawesi. The province area is 3,926 more uh, kilometer square and the population up to 2020 is 2,621,000. There are 11 districts or Kabupaten Indonesia and four Kota or Kota Madia uh, municipalities. So basically uh, my data presentation today will be based on the 2018 because I do calculation and I do uh, all the uh, data from Bureau uh, Statistic Bureau and I could get it uh, accurate data in the 2018. So by 2018, North Sulawesi is 68% Christians. Now, I'm going to talk about the Minahasa Raya. Minahasa Raya basically, uh, this is the map of North Sulawesi, and Minahasa Raya will consist of seven districts and uh, four cities. Basically, not Kota Mabagu and not the other ones uh, up on the north near the Philippines. It's only like this one here. Only from north, uh, Minasa, southeast Minasa, 
um, the, uh, the main land of Minasa, Tomohon, Manado, and Bitung. So the total of Minasa Raya, the population is 1,609,000. Uh, and the Christian people, 2018, is 1.46 million. So it's made of 90.78% in total, only in Minahasa. And the number of churches in 2018 is 3.8 thousand. So uh, there will be so many churches in Minahasa. So basically, this area uh, predominantly Christian. So basically, when we talk about religious tourism in Minahasa, we talk about two biggest Christian celebrations. So the Christmas and the Easter time. So when I talk about Christmas, well, it's well known and it's uh, celebrated all over the globe. So basically people know. My presentation today will focus only in Lantern and Easter time. So Lantern and Easter time is special celebration considering the length and the special moment. So when it starts, basically, and when it ends. So the land starts during the Ash Wednesday and Easter time, which can last for a week after the Easter time. So how long they celebrate? So it takes more than 40 days. So considering the length, so this is a potential uh, time for the government and other stakeholders to work together to elevate tourism in North Sulawesi, basically in Minahasa. So what's going on? Various religious celebrations and community events are celebrated throughout this time. So potential community tourist attraction and attractions throughout the land and Easter. First, communities involvement in decorating religious ornaments and miniatures. So I also provided some pictures that I took it from my personal files and also some pictures from Google. So this is uh, showed how the people in Minasa they decorated during the land time and Easter time. Two, uh, religious events, they celebrated what they call it the Holy Week starting from the Palm Sunday, which is actually now is the land time. From Palm Sunday, it goes up to Maundy Thursday or they call it Holy Thursday. Many people don't know that every Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, Thursday there will be full moon and not many people know about it. So trust me, every Monday, Thursday, there will be full moon. And this can be good for special tourism when they are going to do wellness tourism. Then they go to Good Friday, that they can celebrate Via Dal Rosa. Then it goes up to uh, Sunday for the Easter day, and they can do some Easter parades, torches parade, and decorative cards, etc. just like the pictures that I show you. So here are the pictures when they do the torch uh, parade. Now, then the Easter gatherings, they can do other things like sports uh, or arts, bazaars, games or competition. They can do choir competition and all sort of competition they do throughout the churches. And also you can see the attached children activity during the Easter time when children uh, celebrate on the Sunday school, they do uh, egg searchings and all some, some family may, may do baptism sacraments a day after the Easter. So basically this uh, week will be full of celebrations. And you can see it in Minahasa, people celebrate it much more than, well, Christmas is a time for people to enjoy, but then in Minahasa, Easter also, a great time to, to rejoice and to celebrate together with family and neighbors. So, what I learned other communities can use. First, they can do creative package tourist experience, like in Minahasa. Uh, they can do tour, include other attractions. So besides only religious attraction, they can do other attractions such as natural, cultural, sports, marine, or even adventure and art tourism. And you know that in, in Manado, there's a, one spot for marine science or marine uh, park, Bunaken, everybody knows that. And now you remember that in Manado, in Minahasa, Likupang will be one of the uh, five biggest destinations for the government to grow. 
Then religious tourism is integrated with wellness tourism, as I mentioned before, such as pilgrimage package for special target markets. Then if you come to Manado, you will see there are a lot of uh, statues of uh, Jesus and three of them, I think the biggest in, in Southeast Asia. Then the growing industry, uh, which is I call the homestays, is a very uh, good uh, uh, type of tourism business now that people are growing homestays all over the places where tourists can come and enjoy and, and they can mingle together or living together with the locals. So basically by doing this, they are able to learn more culture. They are able to see how people live in Minahasa. They can learn about the, uh, the dance in Minahasa and also other type of quiz, uh, uh, food tourism or cuisine tourism industry. Then other communities may find special events within their culture to grow. So by looking at this, uh, my, my presentation, other communities or other region can see what what is actually religious celebration they can take it to elevate and to grow it if you look at this picture the last picture this one i show it here this is the picture i took it from one area in manado i was basically surprised when i passed the way i was thinking like jesus is appearing and flying in the air but basically it's not it's only like decoration that the community put it up on the air and i was shocked by looking at the one and it's very interesting for people to see so my presentation will be uh, this time and i would suggest that religious or cultural tourism is still our full sector for certain regions to develop because people uh, tourists still look for novelty for this and minasa will be one of the place one of the great destinations for tourists to visit i think that's all of my presentation because i only get uh, 10 minutes the most and probably i will uh, do some kind of discussion later on by the end of the presentation. Thank you, Prof. Noya. Thanks, Teddy. Um, that's wonderful. Um, and I do again apologize for the length of time you've had, but uh, are you sure that's not a miracle, that uh, statue hanging in the air? No, that was uh, when I was working, uh, I was on the way to campus uh, one morning and I was passing that way. And I was thinking that I, look, I was blessed. I was seeing a miracle that they just appeared on the air. Noel, do you do you believe in miracle, Noel? Oh, I do believe. Um, um, oh. Well, so thank you, Teddy. Um, Prof. Bet, uh, uh, as our next speaker, um, uh, do I believe in miracles? Well, I think you speaking today, <laughs> you, you speaking to us today, will is a miracle, and I feel blessed thank to you. hear you. Um, uh, professor Bet, you're um, a professor of tourism uh, in Manado uh, in Sulawesi. And uh, so thank you for joining us today. Um, you're going to talk to us about uh, a cycling event in Bali, I think. Yes. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, hello, everyone. Last but not least, right now, <laughs> you know, I was sleeping. <laughs> okay, uh, this is actually a participatory uh, action research, right? I uh, participated in this event in Bali in 2018. So uh, automatically the sense of research uh, rise up on me. So I directly uh, try to find out what to do during the event. So comes up with my title, Classic Cycle Sport Tourism and its impact on sustainable cultural tourism. I believe that, uh, that only me interest in doing research at, the, at that event because I was there. What is, uh, this is actually an event in uh, held in Bali in 2018 called International Veteran Cycle Association. So this is uh, probably not most of us know about this, especially if you don't like cycling, cycling. Uh, but I like it very much. So this is actually uh, about uh, the largest old bicycle organization in the world uh, called uh, International Veteran Cycle Association. So in 2018, Indonesia, especially Bali, 
uh, was assigned to host uh, the event. The objective of the association is to encourage interest and activities relating to all, all human powered vehicles of one or more wheels deriving from the philosophical tradition and also to support and encourage research and classification of their history. So that's, I think that's good organization. They know they want to research and so on and so forth. So why also in, I was interested to do research? There are so many various kind of uh, clubs, association, communities uh, during the event. So this is the pictures of national participants for IFCA 2018 in, in Bali. So they, we come from uh, various uh, region within in Indonesia. And uh, I was there with the red one, but they didn't know very well about this costume. So probably we are the one who ride bicycle using or wearing this costume. And this is also uh, international participants. So uh, based on my research, uh, there are 50 countries uh, who are participating in the event. So it's, uh, I, it's very crowded. It is, uh, you know, a big opportunity to, to research a kind of uh, cultural sport tourism event like this. And uh, I found that there are, so no, I mean, there are, uh, by, based on my research, there are 150 participants during the event comes from um, different types of uh, countries. We have Australia, Japan, Belgium, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of uh, nice experiences there. I have some question uh, by the Deb interview factors influencing their participation in the event. So I was asking people, why do you want to participate in the event? And the result is tourism destination image because participants were interested to tourism destination image of Bali. So Bali also has a strong, a very strong uh, image in their mind. Government support because participants got the government support to, to get involved or to attend the event. And then the third one is collective value of local wisdom among classic bicycle communities. So there are so many uh, bicycle communities attended the, um, attended the, the event. Uh, participants had a strong commitment to collective value, right? So we like it very much according to me, according also uh, my community. And this is interesting to know that this is the result of questionnaire. I automatically created the questionnaire at that time, Noel, uh, because I really want to write about this uh, from scientific point of view. Uh, I uh, summarized the, the result from economic aspect, social, cultural aspect, and environmental aspect. In fact, the participant or the event of this, if uh, the participant of this event uh, give contribution to economic aspect. For example, create creation of job opportunities, stay in a hotel, sales of products, services by small, medium enterprises in the event, visitation to related tourism object and attraction, I mean post uh, event, right? Use of commercial transportation and so on and so forth. Social cultural aspect, there are two, two aspects there, local community was involved in a social interaction with cycling fans and participants. So we are we have fans. And also, we also direct participants. Cycling fans and participants share knowledge among the classic bicycle community. So there, there were an open area at that time uh, to share or to mingle or uh, to discuss with other people. And then the third one is environmental aspect. You know, because we use bicycle without without uh, petrol. So. Um, I found that promotion of environmental friendly transportation uh, uh, as a result of this uh, event, promotion of air pollution prevention in cities and promotion of environmental pre preservation. And also uh, there are other results from the interview, 
I, I was asking people impact on sustainable tourism, what about economic aspects, social aspects, environmental aspects. So uh, the pictures is the result, this is a photo taken by me um, during the event. So there is from, especially for economic aspect. So there are so many, uh, they call it clean ticker, who, so, who sell paper spare part, uh, spare part of the bicycles, old bicycle, not modern bicycle, not like um, race bicycle, no, but it's all bicycle. The finding also uh, is about to promote the environmental preservation because uh, besides we have a, a, like an activity to cycle, but we also have like a planting mangrove in an area uh, that they really want to protect the mangrove. So in this uh, event, uh, rise up also the promotion of environmental friendly transportation and also the promotion of air pollution re prevention in cities. So this is the data actually taken. I hope Noel, uh, later we will, I will um, develop the writing into um, a paper that probably can contribute to your book chapter as you asked before. And also, you know, this is also very interesting because my community, we call it Costi or we call it Manado, uh, how do you call it? Setuamo, Sepeda Tua Manado, Old Cycle uh, Manado. We won the, um, the festival or the Indonesian classic bicycle community with customary wore clothing like Pak Teddy. I think Pak Teddy show you before Kabasaran dance. Uh, it is a traditional dance from Minahasa, North Sulawesi. So this is my group. We won um, the parade, cultural right parade, uh, wearing uh, Kabasaran dance. And then the conclusion of this research, action research, very short uh, research, uh, they have acknowledged Bali as the most interesting cultural tourism destination in Indonesia and around the world. And the classic bicycle communities participated with their own government support. So it was amazing because uh, these all participants said that they uh, were supported by the government. Cycle fans, cycle, cycling fans and participants of the classic bicycle communities participated due to their commitment to the collective value of local wisdom, encouraging them to voluntarily maintain and preserve the classic bicycle cultural heritage. So for many people, probably this is very old fashion, but for me, for us, for my community, we really want to maintain and preserve the classic bicycle cultural heritage. And the last one is the classic bicycle tourism event held by IFCA in 2018 had positive impacts on sustainability of cultural tourism from economic, social, cultural, and environmental aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Bed. And uh, it was very interesting to hear. I was thinking about it as you were talking. And it's interesting to see how tourism and the community, there are so many um, connections. Uh, you were talking about benefits for one community of traveling to another one, and also about, you know, um, how a, a community might learn about uh, the value of uh, not using motorized transport through an event. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Kazim, I, I'm sorry, we, we have uh, gone well beyond our specified time. Uh, and I know that there's not a lot of time left. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Thank you to all our speakers. Thanks, Thank Noel. You. And uh, thanks uh, to all of you, your wonderful team and the speakers. Uh, presentations were really informative. Um, I'm going to, uh, I select another video that is only uh, one and a half minutes so that everybody can just move a little bit and we get uh, ready to come back for a hot discussion within the time frame that we have. We can go over about 10 uh, minutes. So we, we have uh, um, maybe another 20 minutes for uh, discussions to 
uh, go after the video. So let's watch the video and please feel free to move and stretch and come back a very fresh um, meanwhile. Let me share the video. And please let me know if you can see it. Hi, my name is Dini Yusuf. I am the founder and CEO of Toraja Melo. We have been working since 2008 and we have been focusing on the weavers of Indonesia to make their life better and also to rejuvenate Indonesian art and culture of handwoven textile. Starting in 2018, now we would like to work in the three areas. The first one is to produce, design and sell various fashion and gift lines made of the weaving area of origin. The second is community-based travel, uh, which is a travel by involving the communities that Toraja Melo works in, uh, in the areas of Toraja, Mamasa, Adonara and Lembata in East Nusa Tenggara. The third one is we really would like to work with the young generation by being a resource person or doing consulting and mentoring. to the start of a Taraji journey! Thank you everyone. Thanks to all. And uh, let's go back to our presenters. Um, I want to start with uh, Siska. Uh, the case of uh, the four villages and um, the um, practice with community. You mentioned about uh, a role model. Um, you, I think, named uh, Kuta as, as one of your examples. So my question is, uh, do you give or do you um, uh, provide a, a model uh, community role or a model practice that in community level, they can uh, understand it and they like it and they want to um, adopt it in their practice? And is Kuta uh, the role model in your case study or not? Thank you very much. If you can elaborate a bit more. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kasim. So um, Kuta is an area, a touristic uh, area mm -hmm. located in the southern part of Bali. And this area is very, very famous, uh, but it's famous for uh, mass tourism. Um, so a lot of, um, I could say that most of Balinese, they would think that if they want to have tourism activities or anything related to tourism, because eco-tourism is also has tourism 
um, in, in as one of the words, or community-based tourism. So everything that related to tourism, they will have this imagination of uh, Kuta, Kuta Beach, Kuta area. Uh, so what I uh, mentioned about the model is um, they, they have this, um, how to say, reference. Oh, Kuta is the way that we have to build our village, like Kuta area. But actually, the village and also the Kuta area, they, they are offering different kind of uh, segment of tourism, uh, tourist market and also tourism activities. So at the time, um, at, uh, when the four villages, they wanted to create um, an alternative tourism, um, the Wisnu Foundation, the non-government organization, also invited them to go to Kuta. So they went to Kuta and then they experienced um, themselves as the tourists. And then they look around. And then after um, walk around about um, one or two hours, they back to the uh, non uh, this yeah, Wisnu Foundation office to have more discussion about, OK, this is, this is the, the tourism that you would like to build in your village or not. So um, when they created community-based tourism or the, the network, um, they, they have been through a lot of uh, process of brainstorming and also um, uh, study. So at the end of this, the processes, um, all these four community uh, communities, they decided that they would like to build something different because when they went to Kuta, they, they, they saw different kind of things. They saw that um, the, the um, environmental impact. They saw also, but oh, the Kuta area um, is so uh, crowded, it's so noisy. And then as the as the people who live in the village, they don't want to have something like that. So that's why they, ca they, they came up with the idea to create this community-based tourism and ecotourism. Um, and then they created their own definition of what is ecotourism that they would like to uh, develop in their village. So that's, uh, I mean, actually by uh, uh, Kuta as a role model for, for most of Balinese like that, but for the, these four villages, that's the beginning of the process. Thanks, uh, Siska. So if I, I, I hope, yeah, I hope that answers your yeah, question. Yeah. If I if I summarize, uh, I think uh, I have the feeling that the the model that uh, you uh, developed is uh, um, people started to capitalize on human capital and social capital and not relying on economic capital only. So yes. uh, building uh, more self-confident that what they need, they have, but they have to uh, learn how they are going to capitalize it and uh, being able to sell it uh, as a tourist and cultural product. Thank you very much. Um, I want to um, uh, move to next uh, presentation with a question from the National Park, Mr. Iqbal. Um, I was wondering, uh, because when you designate a, an area as a national park, you have a lot of regulations and sometimes it, it um, limits the access or um, the local community um, uh, control over their own natural resources or, or resources in general. Uh, what do you think about this national park and the communities that you are working with? Uh, are there any complaint about uh, the national um, park regulations. Thank you for the question, Kazim. Can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, clear. Okay. Yeah, so dealing with community, there will always be a complaint and there will always be a support in that. And before answering the questions further, I would like to say that I'm now on board in a plane, so I will be off soon. So I cannot. <laughs> open my Mac. I'm sorry if the voice is very much unclear. Uh, so yeah, uh, complaints, there will be complaints, there will be support. Uh, and then my duty is to socialize and to uh, interact with them more frequent so they can understand the regulation even further. Sometimes the complaint and disagreement uh, comes because uh, uh, happen just because they don't understand the reasoning behind it. And then uh, from the perspective of uh, the perspective, there is not much time to socialize the regulation uh, to the level that what uh, to the level of their uh, expect, uh, uh, expectation. So by meeting them uh, more frequent by visiting their villages, uh, so far it helped 
the local community more receptive to new regulations and to more um, uh, changes uh, happening in their surrounding villages. I hope that answered the question, Kazim. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, uh, safe travels. I don't want to keep you uh, online when you are in, in, in move and in aircraft. So have a safe travel. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let me thank move you. on to uh, Lita's presentation. Um, Lita has a, a showcase of all um, uh, principles of ecotourism and sustainable tourism development. It's a beautiful uh, example, but um, I was wondering how you developed the social capital, uh, or let's say in in more simple way, how uh, how people trust each other to build up such a beautiful case. How uh, you could uh, distribute the benefits of sustainable or ecotourism development among the community uh, to create uh, such a social capital. Okay, so first of all, um, in the way of, uh, I just give you an example, yeah. So in order to support uh, the, the other, the community share the social capital, they, they share the natural resources uh, and they, they protect it together. I mean, they have a traditional rules or traditional law that uh, as a, how do you say, uh, as a control for them to, to protect the natural, the natural resources. And uh, in within their wisdom, in within their uh, cultural assets, and in within the tourism activities, they they always share it together and like lesson um, and study from one village to the other village. So the other village doesn't make the same mistake, for example, like that. And then so if one village is already experiencing a conflict, for example, like uh, at the beginning, they disagree with uh, the, the international tourists who came with very sexy clothes like that. And then uh, they try to communicate within one village and then how we got to manage it together. And then, uh, because they do not want to have a conflict, they don't want to have like a negative impact to the 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 childrens and etc. And then once they have a a common agreement, and then they share it with other with other villages, and then it becomes a common rules for the others. That that's one of the example. And also uh, by utilizing a a crafting method. Like before, it was only the older ladies who's, who's creating the crafting um, from special natural resources and only uh, they're taking it only from one places. But because it's very important as a part of tourism and conservation and then now they share and then it's uh, not only one, one place that they that they exploit for the, the materials, but now they have like several places. And then so it's like when one area is already taken and then they close the area and then they conserve it for a little while. And then so they can take it in other, under other villages like that. Um, thank you so much. I think the role of leadership and community yeah. leaders is very significant in your case. Yes, correct. And it, uh, it's very, um, important to uh, know and to identify the leaders. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, I hear about programs saying uh, leader training, but I don't believe we can train leaders. We have to find the leaders because they, they have uh, uh, their own uh, charismatic people in the community that if we join a force with them, we can, we can have a shortcut to the development. Thank you so much, um, Elita. And uh, if I... Um, we can move on to Teddy's uh, presentation about the Christianity uh, and the Christian celebrations. <laughs> I'm curious to know how uh, tourism 
affected the practice itself in terms of authenticity? Is it um, any change um, um, in terms of religious tourism and the practice itself or not? Thank you, Mr. Kazem. Well, basically the reason why I take this issue uh, because uh, the tourism in religious issue, basically they do much on uh, Christmas time, but basically in Minahasa, during the Lent and Easter time, it's not being uh, touched or it's not being elevated much. So basically uh, what I'm proposing is the government and other stakeholders may be able to do something to elevate this so that uh, religious tourism can be also the authenticity and novelty of the Minahasan people and how they celebrate land time, Easter time will be uh, an attraction for local or even national and even uh, for international tourists to come over. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, just to uh, save time to have our main architect back to Noel, I have my last question. And as she mentioned, the last but not the least, a bit uh, uh, mentioned about the very interesting case study of the bicycles. And I'm very interested to know uh, from when this has started. So uh, what is the history of using bicycles in the region? Um, is it something very special in that area or people have been using uh, uh, in their everyday life? Uh, why they, they have uh, this special um, destination and bicycle uh, branding, let's say? Yes. Um... Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, for in, in Indonesia, old bicycle is very famous. So there are almost all provinces uh, in Indonesia has their community. Uh, we call it uh, Skosti, like a com community for old bicycle for each region in Indonesia. So uh, in fact, not only in Indonesia, but also all over the world. Uh, the data shows us that uh, there are 50, uh, 50 countries participated in the event that I mentioned uh, where I did the research. So I think not only Indonesia, but uh, all over the world. You can imagine comes from 50, 50 uh, countries uh, representing their countries to come to participate in the event. So I think uh, the cycle, the uh, cultural cycle or old bicycle uh, in the world is still a very important aspect to, for me as tourism people, uh, I was interested to, to research how tourism connected to this event. We can uh, do like, we can say that this is like a sport event or cultural event or cultural or mice, mice tourism or cultural tourism. Uh, that's why there are so many topics we can uh, research. We can uh, research by this event. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, if, I, if I'm right, so we can also uh, look at the um, destination image uh, building uh, impact mm -hmm. of this uh, image and this uh, not as just uh, an attractive uh, part of the destination, but as a part of the destination image uh, and branding the destination. Thank you so much. Um, I can I can uh, see a lot of questions in the chat room, but before that, I want to ask uh, Noel if he because we did a, a similar. Uh, webinar with uh, the case of Sri Lanka before. And uh, uh, because you have a lot of experiences in different countries, Noel, um, if we want to have a takeout lesson home as our Professor Jafar Jafari um, and Professor Duarte Moraes uh, mentioned in other webinars, uh, what are the takeout lessons uh, that you are uh, giving us today, Noel? Mm. Oh, well, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. I, 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 would, uh, I would score that as a hard question, but fair. Um, 
I well, there's a couple of things that have come from today. I, I was particularly intrigued by Teddy's presentation um, about um, Minahasa because you know I, I, you become familiar with the resources of your own community, and so for me, it was a bit of a shock to think that a Christian event could be something which was a um, useful for community-based tourism. But of course it is. It's just another um, authentic cultural event. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think is uh, always unusual about community-based tourism. Or you, you, the people who are, who are operating or, or presenting their community and to tourists they may actually take um they may actually feel that uh there's nothing to show people that these are just traditional things and everyone you know it's just another dance or it's just another um uh, easter present you know event but for people from around from different cultures these things are incredibly interesting and so most communities have the opportunity to display and present uh, their culture and heritage and history, um, but may not realize it, I suppose. So that's one of the, the key things for me. And, and how people identify those things and perhaps even um, decide what they want to show people and what they, didn't, they don't want to show people is a very interesting process um, that I think is common, you know, in different places around the world. So the, I, I guess that's one comment I could make. Hmm. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, I think um, it's, it's even in Japan, I have seen um, some local communities that they're living in a kind of a, um, world heritage site. Uh, we have world agricultural heritage. For them, it's very usual everyday life and the part of their um, their environment. But uh, for us that are looking at from outside, it's very special. And then it takes some time to convince the community that uh, what you think it's usual, it's, uh, it's very attractive and you can, um, you can be represented by this um, for many reasons. And um, I got, I got uh, uh, really the, the same impression with working in uh, rural Japan and the societies that they are carrying more of Japanese culture alive. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, I feel a pity if we don't give the participants uh, time to have a question. So we can have maybe one or two questions from participant. Uh, if you have any question, please uh, let us know. Uh, and meanwhile, I want to send you a link. We have a questionnaire. So in the chat, uh, if you see um, the link, um, there is a Google uh, questionnaire that can help us to serve you better. And uh, your uh, comments are very valuable for us. Uh, before you uh, forget your memories and the good information that we received from the panelists, um, if you take uh, maybe three minutes to answer the questions, uh, we really uh, appreciate it. Um, any question from our participants? Um, Mr. Hijra, do we have any question in the list? I think uh, a lot of question and answer was ongoing and uh, in the chat, people got their uh, answers. Please visit our website. Um, and if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact us. We can keep you in touch with the presenters as um, you need. <clears throat> okay, I suppose no question. Um, on behalf of the Scott team, Professor Jafar Jafari, uh, Duarte Morais, and myself, uh, once again, and I thank all of you for your um, time and participation and a very special thank to our presenters uh, and Professor Noel Scott uh, for building up this beautiful event. Uh, thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you thank very you. much for organizing. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks.